Well, in alphabetical order, we will start with uh, Congressman Dr. Ralph Abraham. Would you come to the stage, please? <laughs> Congressman Abraham was born and raised in Louisiana. He grew up breaking horses and building fences on a farm in Richland Parish, near where he and his wife of 43 years, Diane, still reside today. Together they have three grown children and nine grandchildren. They are members of Alto Baptist Church. Ralph is currently serving his third term in Congress and rep represents Louisiana's fifth congressional district. He has served on a half a dozen committees, including the House Agriculture Committee and the House Committee on Veterans Affairs. He has intimate knowledge and experience on a multitude of issues facing Louisiana. Please welcome Dr. Ralph Abraham. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And last but not least, Mr. Eddie Rasponi. Mr. Rasponi is a lifelong Louisianian, avid outdoorsman, and Christian conservative candidate for governor. Eddie loves Louisiana. Guided by his faith, family, and the blessing of God in his life, Eddie feels called to give back to the state that has given him so much. Eddie is not a career politician. Eddie is a successful entrepreneur, business executive, and conservative outsider who has the experience and expertise to move our state forward. Please welcome Eddie Rasponi. And I also invite to the stage our two moderators for the evening, Mr. Gifford Briggs, President of the Louisiana Oil and Gas Association. And Tyler Gray, the President and General Counsel of the Louisiana Mid-Continent Oil and Gas Association. Thank you all very much for coming. I know that uh, a lot of you have been here for, the, for all day today and, and are looking forward to hearing from our candidates and what they, they believe the future for the oil and gas industry would look like if they were to get elected. Uh, real quick, I want to go over the format for tonight um, as it's currently laid out. Um, we are going to start out with uh, an opening introduction from each of the candidates and allow for uh, three minutes for an introduction period. Then after that we're going to go right into a series of three questions. We will take turn alternating between the candidates to answer each question. Uh, they will both answer each question and they will be allotted up to three minutes. They certainly don't have to take the full time. Um, but this is not going to be in sort of the debate format where we go back and forth. Each candidate has the three minutes will rotate and if there's anything they need to would like to address it would have to be done within their three minute time. Um, after, after the first set of three questions we're going to go into a lightning round uh, which should be, should be fun. Um, and then we're going to, we'll do three more questions, one more quick lightning round and then we'll wrap up with closing statements. So first of all thank you both gentlemen very much for taking time out of your schedule. We know how busy you are. Uh, obviously we appreciate that you know that the oil and gas industry is important to Louisiana and you took time to be with us here today. So with that I'm going to turn it over to Tyler to get us started. Thank you Gifford and, and again thank you both of you all for being here. We really appreciate that. So we're going to start off with just uh, three minutes for opening remarks and Congressman Agra Abraham if you would go ahead and go first. Well thank you so much for having me. It's always good to be among oil and gas people. We, uh, on the federal level, hopefully have been your friends and will continue to be. In Louisiana, as you know, you are our lifeblood. We have been and hopefully will be for the foreseeable future, far into the uh, next generations, have you as our partner in this state because without you, we do not do well at all. Your current governor, as we all know, he's not with us. Uh, he's actually at a fundraiser in Atlanta. He should be here, but he's not. He is killing your industry. We, I, will be your friend, as we have been, and I will be your ally. A lot to talk about. I'm going to get it in quick in three minutes. We know that the legal system is just decimating you, and we're going to change that very, very quickly, whether it's with an executive order, whether it's with the constitutional amendment, Whatever it takes, we've got to get your legal climate back under control where you can actually do business, and we are going to do that. There is a letter out that the governor wrote uh, early on in his career that told the six coastal parishes either you sue or he was going to sue. We tore that up. That's going to be gone, and that will change on day one. Wynn and I were talking that we have to allow those relative state agencies to partner with you guys and you ladies 
and come up with a solution of how to get rid of these frivolous suits. And that's got to happen. I also understand that we have got to allow y'all to have voluntary environmental audits so that every time you put a shovel in the ground, you don't have to hold your back, hold your breath or look over your back, that somebody's going to come down on you. Taxes, taxes, taxes. That's all this governor wants to do. We're going to reverse ITEP on day one. We've got to eliminate the franchise tax. We're going to phase out this inventory tax because I know it's smothering you to death right now. And at the same time, we are going to bring businesses in. We understand that we have to reinstate that sales tax exemption for industries that have direct input. It's a double tax. It's wrong. It's only, we're the only state in the South that does that, and we're going to get that away. Infrastructure. I love P3s. I never understood why government would not partner with industry that already has the manpower and the tools in place to do those projects. We know, look, I've been to the Calcasieu Ship Channel. I know it needs to be 40 feet and 400 feet wide. We've got to get that and we've got to maintain that or not, you cannot move goods. I've been out to Fushan where you've got the raised LA-1. It's got to be completed. So we're going to honor those past contracts. We're going to get those things completed and let you guys go do what you do best, and that is go to work. And the last thing, because I know I'm getting close to my three minutes, is I see what has happened in North Dakota. I see what's happening in Minnesota when you let these radical environmentalists into your arena. They not only are a public safety hazard, but they disrupt business. I assure you, as your governor, I will do everything in my power by law and by other means to prevent that from happening to you good people out there. So again, thank you for allowing me to speak. Thank you for what you do. And know that moving forward as your next governor, I will be hand in pocket with you as your partner. Thank you. Thank you, Congressman. Mr. Esponi, uh, your opening remarks. Thank you. I appreciate y'all having us here. This is a wonderful audience. Uh, like we heard earlier, you are drive this economy. You know, I've been in the oil and gas service business now for 40 years. I know what it takes to do this. I know how to create jobs. We've had over thousands of our associates work in the oil and gas industry, particularly in refining and pipeline. So I have an appreciation for what it means to work in the oil and gas industry, and I know what drives it. The things that we're going to do different, you know. I think we need an outsider. I think we need a business person. I know we need someone that's not beholden to special interests, particularly plaintiff attorneys. And it's someone that knows how to get something done. And that's what I'm here for. I know how to create jobs and I know how to fill those jobs of Louisiana citizens. What am I going to do for the oil and gas industry? Immediately, I, when the day I'm elected, the next morning, I'm going to be on the phone calling all the oil and gas companies in Louisiana. Say, we got a new sheriff in town, no trial lawyer. We're going to be, we're going to be working with you. We're going to make sure that we protect our jobs, bring you back here, keep you here in Louisiana. We're going to ask you to be a part of solving the problems that we have in Louisiana when it comes to oil and gas. And then I'm going to reach out to all the local elected officials in those parishes that have sued us. And I'm going to tell them the same thing. You have to be a part of bringing this economy back to Louisiana. And you're going to be at the table to work with us in the oil and gas industry to solve the problems and bring those jobs back. That's what I'm going to do the first day I'm in office. And then I'm going to reach out to our Attorney General and I'm going to say, Jeff, you've got to help us solve the lawsuit abuse. Take it back. We have to bring this back. Get rid of the lawsuit abuse. Work with my Attorney General to do so. That is what I'm going to do immediately as soon as I'm elected. And then what I'm going to do, the first day I'm sworn in, I'm going to have an executive order that's going to tell the Department of Natural Resources, do your job. Do your job. We have thousands of permits that they claim that were violated. But we haven't even looked at them. That they've had four years to look at them and they haven't reviewed the first one. They are going to go to work and review these and get rid of all these frivolous lawsuits. If, if you have done something wrong, you haven't filed a permit, we have the authority to fix that and fix the environment. But giving it to a bunch of trial lawyers on a contingency fee and they walk away is not the way to do this. And it's the litigation takes forever. In the meantime, we're not we're losing jobs, we're not fixing the environment. 
We have the authority to do that. Fix the environment. Take care of our, our state. That's the things that I'm going to do right off the bat. We are going to bring jobs back to Louisiana. I'm going to see to it. We're going to tell the trial lawyers we got a new sheriff in town. We're not dependent on you any longer. We are going to make Louisiana great again. Number one in the South when it comes to jobs and opportunities because we're going to have a job creator as your governor. Someone that knows how to create jobs, work with job creators. I've been in your industry now for 40 years. I know this industry. No governor, no one has ever run for governor has worked the number of people we have in this industry and for that matter in all the chemical industry, industrial industry. I'm going to be there to take this back and we're going to create jobs. And thank you for listening. All right, so um, before we got up here, just to make sure, we, we had a, a very um, highly technical drawing of names scribbled on paper um, was how we determined both the way that the, the opening would go and how we would do the questions, and we're going to rotate it between them. It just so happened when well, we drew, we drew the, the names in the exact same order. So uh, just so you know, the questions are going to rotate now, starting again. We're going to start with Congressman Abraham first, because that's the rotation, and then and we'll keep rotating back and forth. Both of you gentlemen um, spoke very passionately in your opening remarks uh, about the, the industry and particularly with regard to our legal climate. Um, without doubt, for, for many of the people in the room, uh, the legacy and coastal lawsuits are the top issue. Um, they have, uh, for all practical purposes, decimated the oil and gas industry, particularly in South Louisiana, Cadiana, Homa. Um, you know, we've seen record job losses. Lafayette was just uh, announced as number three in the country for job, job losses loss. over the past five years. Uh, and so, most recently, I think this was even came from DNR on Monday, we saw that there were zero rigs in inland waters and two rigs in South Louisiana land. Um, and we know that, that the legacy and coastal lawsuits are not the only tort challenges that we're facing in Louisiana. So how as governor will you be able to help the, move, the state move forward to be able to encourage investments in Louisiana and put an end to the unnecessary lawsuits, litigation, coastal lawsuits, legacy lawsuits, and the various other tort challenges that we know that we're facing in Louisiana? The industry is suffering mightily, you know it firsthand, simply because of these legacy lawsuits and our tax structure. Those two big issues have to be addressed and they have to be addressed immediately. And as I said in my opening statement, what we must do, we must partner with you to help us in these frivolous lawsuits. You will be at the table. We see the billboards, we know what it's done, and it's just abominable that we are the only state in the nation, the only state that has lost jobs in the last 12 months. Well, where have all the jobs gone? Well, they've gone away from your industry. So. You give me a legislature and we're going to have a good one when we uh, convene back in uh, the new January coming up after the election. As your leader, we institute true fiscal reform. We call a special session and we address lawsuit abuse, we address the tort reform, and we uh, address the tax problem hand in hand. Yeah, do we have to bring that jury threshold down from 50,000 to five? Absolutely, because right now what's happening, these trial attorneys doc, judge shop and they know who's sympathetic and they know who's not and they go out and they make a phone call and all of a sudden they settle the suit without input from y'all. So if somebody gets hurt on your rig, turn an ankle, which should go home for two days and be back on the rig, that turns into a lawsuit and you know that has happened over and over and over. We've got double recovery in Louisiana where you know you can pay two pay and you've got phantom medical charges that are out there, never done, but they're charged for. So all these things have to come into play and we, if we don't get those three things in line, if we don't bring you to the table, if we don't have that special session where we specifically say, this is what you're here to fix, then we're going to be right back where we are. And the old saying is, if, if you do what you've always do, you're going to get what you always got. I'm going to fix that. We're going to stop it. And these legacy lawsuits, certainly the frivolous ones and the ones that will drive and have driven you out of the state will end very, very quickly. Thank you. 
that question? Ed, uh, Ed yes, your, your three minutes. You want to same, question? same question, sure. So the, the coastal and legacy lawsuits have been um, obviously decimating our industry, and we've seen the rig count in South Louisiana and Lafayette right now from zero rigs in inland waters and two rigs in South Louisiana land. Um, how can you as governor help to move the state forward, encourage investment in Louisiana, and put an end to the unnecessary litigation, coastal lawsuits, legacy lawsuits, and the other tort challenges that are facing our state? Well, yeah, I spoke earlier to the legacy lawsuits and coastal lawsuits. How we do that? You know, we, we, we go with the Attorney General, we go with the Department of Natural Resources, we bring the, all parties together, and we work together to solve that problem. That's how we do that, the legacy lawsuits. It is very complicated how we're going to work on that. But we have some great ideas coming from you, and we have, we're going to go and sit down with the locals, and they're going to buy into it because it's all about jobs. It's all about bringing these jobs back here. And when we start talking about jobs, and we start talking about Boudreaux and Terrio and Kaye and all them leaving to go work somewhere else, and we bring that to the public's attention, we'll get it fixed. And then we're going we're gonna to fix the, bring the jobs back, but we're also going to fix our coast at the same time and protect our environment. So that, that part of it is how I would address that, and I would continue to do that and work together. I'm not beholden to special interest groups. I'm not beholden by the trial lawyers by no means. Now, from the other side, you talk about other lawsuit abuse. We all know we have the second highest auto insurance in the country. It is killing jobs. In the logging industry, they're about to go out of business. The cane farmers, they're paying $16,000 a truck per, per cane, per meal, I guess you call it, per harvest, 100 days. We, and it's killing the, the, I guess you call them, the heavy haulers, but the people who haul. But it's not just the heavy haulers. It's all transportation. It's killing them in, in their car insurance, their automobile insurance. But the worst thing that we're not talking about, it is the lower and middle income families. They're the ones getting hit the hardest. Us that have a good quality job, it just frustrates us and aggravates us that we have to pay this insurance. We have to cut back somewhere else. But these low income and middle income families, they can't keep their job. This insurance is putting them out of work. You know why? Because they buy the insurance and then it gets so expensive that they have to make a decision between food and rent and necessities and they wind up not paying the insurance. The, the, the motor vehicles sends a notice, suspends their license. Now they got a problem and then they lose their license and they can't get to work. It's asinine, people. We have to do something different. We want these people to have a quality job and be able to go to work and we're ignoring this. This is what our trial law is. This is what our legal system is doing to us. We have to make that change. And as governor, we're going to attack that right off the bat. I tell people, they made a mistake when they killed Kurt Talbot's bill in the Senate. Because we're going to load it down this time, and it's going through with me as governor. We're going to fix it. We're not going to be the second worst in the country. It's not fair to everyone, particularly low and middle income families. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Rispone, for you'll be next on our next question. Um, so our, our next question, um, for the petrochemical and manufacturing sector, something that you know very well, uh, we have seen significant tax increases making Louisiana less competitive, especially with our neighboring states like Texas and Mississippi. Could you talk a little bit about what your plans are to improve that competitiveness, especially talking about you know the business utilities or the industrial tax exemption program? Yes. Well, let's talk about the industrial tax exemption program. We have a governor that listened to a socialist group and through chaos in an executive order, killing thousands of jobs, creating a shock wave through our manufacturing, a shock wave. Jobs just disappeared and they still haven't recovered from it because they don't know which direction they're going to go. That's what this governor did. That's not what I do. Someone that's been in the business, someone that appreciates what those jobs are about. You know, I will bring the, the manufacturing people together, all of our industry together. I will bring the local partners together and we will sit down and come up with a plan that's good for everyone, that takes in consideration the concerns of the local. But then we're going to put that back in the economic development. So we will have consistency, predictability. We're not running around trying to worry about a rogue sheriff or a rogue sh uh, school board. You know, we'll have that back where it belongs. 
They will have what they need, and that's what you do if you're a business person. Someone who's been involved in the industry understands things like that. I'll bring them all together and we'll make that work. That's the eye tip as they referred to right now. On the bigger picture, we have to have a constitutional convention. I would not be running if I wasn't bold enough to say we have to get us a real constitution. We have a book of statutes. We don't have a constitution. We have to be competitive with the rest of the country. We have to redo our taxes and revenues articles. We have to go at that and make us competitive. Treat all those taxes, get a package where we can compete, not just around the United States, around the world. And that's the thing we'll do about tackling that and generate jobs. Well, thank you for that. Congressman Abraham, uh, just to repeat the question, just to make sure that, so as we discussed, the manufacturing industry continues to lose in the competitiveness to some of our neighboring states like uh, Texas and Mississippi. And just if you could talk a little bit about, you know, how that's affected uh, or could improve here in the state, specifically as it relates to the business utilities and the ITEP. Well, as I said in my opening statement, you know, ITEP day one will we'll reverse John Bell's ITEP program and hopefully return it to where you have a little predictability, you have a little certainty, and you can plan. The members of this group here, you don't plan for next week, you don't plan for next month. You have to look out years sometime to invest literally hundreds of millions of dollars in your infrastructure. And look, I appreciate that uh, for it being in Louisiana. Tyler, to your question, and I, I think I addressed it also in the opening uh, statement, we do have to reinstate that sales tax exemption for those manufacturing utilities that have direct input because it is a double tax and it has taken the competitive edge off of Louisiana compared to other states. We are the only state that does that. Remember who we're dealing with here. This is a John Bell Edwards that is a trial attorney that has raised our taxes eight billion dollars in three and a half years. And I can't find where one new penny, not one new penny, has gone to infrastructure. We know if you can't get food, if you can't get fuel, if you can't get people to your rigs, whether they're dry land or off the shelf, then you cannot do business. And if we don't reinvest in infrastructure, then as a state and as businesses, one, you're not going to come. And if you're here, you're going to leave as soon as you can. And we're going to continue to be 50th out of 50 as we are now compared to the nation. We have to get these jobs back. We've lost over 60,000 permanent residents. They've gone mostly to Texas, but now they're going to Mobile. Now they're going to Knoxville. Now they're going to Florida. And it goes back to excessive tax just out of out of this craziness legal climate that we all have to live in and lack of good infrastructure so that's where we need to go Tyler. awesome thank you and congressman probably get to stay standing here given that uh, there's only two of you rotating back and forth <laughs> and uh you know, we didn't plan it like this, but y'all keep continuing to set the questions up because obviously it seems like the, the topics of conversation that, that are important to you are, are the same ones that we've got. So the next question is on infrastructure. Um, infrastructure obviously is critical to the oil and gas operations throughout the state of Louisiana, whether it's pipelines, roads, bridges, waterways. You can't move oil and gas without sound infrastructure, and Louisiana needs improvement, obviously. Um, we've got members here that at one point in time almost lost their business because bridges had been posted uh, that, that blocked access. We have, oh, your time's up. Um, <laughs> Multitasking, it's what we do. Um, we had another company that wanted to d drill an exploration well, and in order to be able to do that, they had to go build their own bridge to be able to get access to the site. So obviously, infrastructure I is key if we're gonna continue to see sound oil and gas investment and a bright future for our industry. What is your plan to improve our infrastructure in the state of Louisiana and all of those, ca those capacities? Are we looking at a gas tax? Are we looking at public-private partnerships? Is it capital outlay appropriations, a combination of all of the above? So what is your yes. vision for, yes, what is your vision for infrastructure in Louisiana? Gifford, as we know, infrastructure is 
at a crisis level. To your point, over 60% of our bridges have been deemed dangerous, and some of them have been deemed worse than that, and we now have not only services that have to go around, now we have law enforcement and we have ambulance that cannot get to a particular place, and it is a public safety issue. So it's gotta be fixed. Now, all you mentioned, all options are on the table. Certainly, as you heard me say in the opening statement, I love P3s because with the knowledge base, with the workforce base, with the equipment base right out here, you have a wealth that you can draw from and get these projects done far quicker, far more efficient than a solely government entity. I work at the federal government level now, and we know how inefficient it is. The same thing in our state DOTD right now. You've got inefficiency, you've got a transportation trust fund that has no accountability, which, as you know, Gifford, is funded by gas tax now, and there is nothing that is done proactive. We've got $14 billion in backlogs. There is no way in the world we can service that at the rate we're going. You heard me say that this governor has raised your taxes and not one new penny has gone to infrastructure. We get asked a lot about the gas tax. Look, all options are on the table. We understand this has to be fixed. I'll make it tax neutral, and that's easy to do because I've looked at all our taxes, and we do have the second, sometimes the first highest sales tax in the nation. We have the highest corporate income tax in the South. We have personal income tax. We need to talk more about a flat tax on that. And uh, again, franchise taxes, inventory taxes, these things, we're just tax, tax, tax. And this is what this governor has done. I was at the LSU football game going to tailgating. I didn't get to stay for the game because I had to go to another event. Guess who I saw? The governor. Well, he stood up there on, what, two legislature sessions ago and said he was going to close LSU football if he didn't get a sales tax increase. So that's not going to happen. We're going to get this right. We're going to do. We're going to be the adult in the room. We're going to go through the legislature. We'll have a supermajority, and they can get this done very quickly with a governor that understands how to lead. So, Gifford, to your question, gas tax possible. We're all again, all options are on the table. P3s, I love them, and other whatever it takes. This has got to be fixed because we are in a crisis mode, and if we don't get this fixed then shame on us for, uh, for not doing it. Thank you. Eddie? Okay. Well, we know infrastructure is uh, critical. We know our roads and bridges are in terrible shape. We don't have to keep saying it over and over again. We just have to do something different. We've had career politicians for years and years keep kicking the can down the road. So we need someone from the outside, someone that's a business person, someone that has not be holding a special attention, but someone is going to do the right thing to move our state forward. And that's what I'm going to do. We're going to go in the Department of Transportation. We know we're spending $133 million a year on bureaucrats' wages and benefits. Gas tax, where it was supposed to go the roads and bridges, immediately we're going to stop that. We're going to put that back in the roads and bridges. Then we know we have the capital outlay. The capital outlay, we spend hundreds of millions of dollars. We're going to look at the capital outlay. We're going to say, we're going to prioritize where we're spending that money. We're not going to be spending it on pet projects to get votes. We're going to take another hundred and something million dollars. And we're going to take those dollars and put them together. And we're going to come up with several hundred million dollars that we can put in the roads and bridges. We can do that right away. Then we can look at the Department of Transportation and look at the efficiency and what are we doing. We're spending $400 million, of which some of that is gas tax that we're spending. We have to go in there and make sure they're efficient and see where we can save money. Again, prioritize things, modernize it, make sure it's working, and get some more money and keep matching it. Those are the things we're going to do right off the bat. But the other thing we're going to do is very critical. As a business person, we know how to prioritize things. This governor has used it as a political whip. You and Acadiana have got no projects because you didn't vote to raise billions of dollars of taxes. And that's other areas. Every conservative area around our state got penalized. That's what this governor did. That's not what I'm going to do. We're going to set the priorities. We're going to use feasibility studies for every project. We're going to look at cost reward on every project. 
We're going to be practical like we do in business and prioritize it. That's how we're going to run our business. It's not going to be this cronyism that we've seen from politicians for not on both sides of the coin, whether they're Republican or Democrat. You're going to have an outsider, someone that's not beholden special interests, someone that understands how to move this state forward, understands the importance of the infrastructure, and get it done. And that's what I'm going to do when it comes to infrastructure. Thank you. I'm about to make, set my alarm off one more time here real quick. So um, we're moving into the lightning round and, and have a little oh. bit of fun here. Um, so in the, in the spirit, I, I think LSU football was mentioned, and this is quite possibly going to cost me maybe 50% of our membership. But all right, all right, all right. Um, <laughs> you, you, want, you want me to tackle you now? <laughs> So, so the lightning question, we're shortening our answers to 15 seconds here. Um, and uh, these are designed, I think, to get to know a little bit about you, maybe the things we don't. I think you can probably uh. answer the question from, from where you're seating. So first up, um, I believe, and we're going to go this direction for this set of lightning rounds, and then we'll come back this way when Tyler asks his. So I believe both of you have grandchildren, is that correct? 24. Absolutely. 24. That's right. Very good. We all love the grandchildren because that's what it's all about, right? They're all perfect. What do they call you? <laughs> call me Papa. Papa. All well, right. They call me Doc. Doc. All right. Very it. good. That's a great call, Doc. <laughs> well, uh, question number two. What was the name of your most loved pet and what type of animal was it? I had a dog named Sut. What was it? Sut. Sut. It was black and we called him Sut. Sut. <laughs> Very good. I had a uh, Ch Chesapeake Bay Retriever that I called Drake. Drake. All right. Very good. Well, thank you very much for that. And we'll get to the next set of questions with Tyler now. So I have a much less fun question. <laughs> um, so the first, the first part of this question, as you all know, there'll be constitutional amendments that are going to be on the ballot on October 12th. So the first part of this question is, are you familiar with constitutional amendment number one, having to do with the OCS? And then also, over the past few years, we've heard a lot about the Constitutional Convention. And so what are your thoughts on a potential convention? And we'll start with you, Congressman Abraham, and then you after that, Mr. Rispone. Thank you. Um, I'm not opposed to a Constitutional Convention. Uh, look, I'll be elected to lead. And again, with that supermajority, I certainly think we can move critical legislation very quickly without the convention. But again, if we have to have one, uh, we will open it. But we have to be very careful because there is no such thing as a limited constitutional convention at this point. And if you open the Constitution, then things like protecting the unborn, our Second Amendment rights, are on the chopping block. So we have to be very careful uh, about that. And then uh, an Amendment 1, if you don't mind just mentioning that as well. Oh yes, look, we have got to support that coastal line. It's, it's, it's existential next to our people. It's the most important thing, so absolutely. Sounds good. Mr. Responding? Yeah. Uh, the, the Amendment 1 for understand is the, is the taxes on energy being used as a raw product in manufacturing? So the, the amendment is where you have you store product on shore and then it's shipped to the Outer Continental Shelf and it would exempt property from being taxed. So it's, a, yeah. it's geared directly toward oil and gas operations in the Gulf of Mexico. Right. And, I, and we'd have to support that. We would have to support that because that's where the product is going and that's where the taxes are going to be paid. And it's the same with the gas tax. I mean with the utility tax as well and and I guess the point I want to make there why is that an amendment why do we have to have an amendment to our Constitution that already tell you something right there we know because we got two or three parishes that want to interpret a tax a certain way and and we have to have an amendment we have to have a Constitution a constitutional uh, convention folks we have to have a real Constitution like I said earlier it has to have a structure so we can have our legislators move forward. It is three times larger than any other state. It's ridiculous. It's ten times larger than our national constitution. I mean, something has to give here. We have all these statues in there. Our legislators can't even do their job. There's all these dedicated funds and all these things that handcuff them. What they going to do? They only represent 11% of the total budget that they can service you, the citizens. We have got to have a constitutional convention. I wouldn't be running otherwise. And Doc is, is, is accurate when he says we're going to have a conservative legislature, a more conservative House, and finally get a conservative Senate. I am completely confident as governor that we can move that bill through, 
get our constitutional convention, and then we can go out and elect delegates, elect good delegates that can come together, and then we can get the institutions like Pelican Institute and others to bring to them the recommendations that need to be changed, higher constitution needs to be changed and get a real constitution and put the power back into people's hands through their legislators. How are they going to prioritize? How are we going to spend our money? It's ridiculous we have things that have been in, in place 40 years. You think things hadn't changed in 40 years? We just keep having addendum after addendum after addendum. We have to have that. It's not something I'm just going to say might happen. It has to happen. And me as your governor, someone that's be not beholden to special interest, someone that has a tenacity, an entrepreneur who will not take no for an answer, failure for an answer. I've been in business for 40 years. We don't look at risk that way. We get things done. And that's what we'll do. We're going to turn this state around finally where we can be competitive with the rest of the country. And it starts with that Constitution Convention. And we're going to cover education and all those things. But what we have to do, it's ridiculous we have this amendment even on the books right now. Thank you. Thank you for that. So we have one more tax question. Uh, Congressman Abraham, here in Louisiana, our exploration and production companies operate on very thin margins. And in, in office or once in office, to help stimulate drilling, would you consider any tax ex incentives on oil and gas to increase production? Absolutely. All right, Mr. Responi. Of course. <laughs> yeah. You know, we have, I might answer that a little bit longer. You know, we have an excise tax is the highest, it really is the highest. But we have to be realistic here, folks. We have to have this constitutional convention and look at it in a hard way. We can do some tweaking by that constitution's going on. We can remove some taxes here and there. We don't need the sales tax. You know, we have a $500 million, uh, we call it, I don't know what he calls it. I call it overtax. You know, from what he threw at us, you know, we, we have taxes, he asked for a million, billion, nine, and now he's, he says we got, uh, you know, excess taxes or what he called reserves or whatever. You know, that's ridiculous what we have there. We have to do something different, and that's where I would go with that. All right, excellent. And so uh, we're going to come to the last question before lightning rounds and closing uh, comments right now. And so we're going to start with you, Mr. Responi. So um, this is lightning round. This is not lightning round. Oh. No, no, yeah. no, no. I only get two I lightning round about questions. My chicken. We gotta, I had a we... favorite chicken. I forgot his name. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you you can tell us the name of the pet, but we certainly can give Congressman Abraham an opportunity to tell us the second favorite pet. If that. <laughs> I don't have a favorite chicken, but I know what to do with a chicken. <laughs> All right. Where he's from, they eat chickens. We just played with them. Listen, we can be up here. Tyler and I can make up lightning round questions right. for the next hour if everybody yeah, wants yeah, to stick yeah. around, as long as we might bring the bar inside. Um, all right. Uh, so uh, we discussed earlier in the day in one of our meetings, we talked about some of the responsibilities and the impact that the, the, and what's at stake in these elections. And, and one of the things that we pointed out was that the governor, once, once elected, uh, has the, the responsibility of making over 5,000 appointments and has a significant influence that extends well beyond just the normal legislative process and, the, and, and you know, the activities that, that people are normally think about when it comes to governing. So could you share with everyone uh, what your administration would look like, um, how, what you would like to accomplish, and what you would like to focus on in your first 100 days, and I'm not asking for all 5,000 appointments, but uh, in the, fir <laughs> the first 100 days, um, what would you like to accomplish, what would your industry look like and in, in, in the first 100 days? Well, my first 100 days are going to start the day I'm your governor-elect. We're going to go to work immediately the next day. I told you earlier. Get on the phone, call all oil and gas people in Louisiana and tell them we're open for business. You, we're going to go after this. We're going to fix these problems. That's one area. And I told you I was going to call the locals and tell we're going to fix that as well. But the other thing I'm going to do, immediately, as an executive, we're used to going out and recruiting talented people. Talented people will work for a governor that's a business person. Someone that they understands how to make a budget. Someone that understands transparency and accounting. Someone that understands zero base budgeting and how to make a plan, a two-year plan, see things, get results based on, on uh, just results. You know, that's how we operate in business. 
So I'm going to go out and recruit some talented people over these agencies, not political cronies that helped me get elected like this governor has. It's been a disaster. You can talk about the Department of Health, Department of Revenues, you go through it. Wildlife and fishery, it's everywhere you turn we've had a disaster. So I'm going to go out there and do it the right way. That's what I'm going to be working on between the time I'm elected and the time I'm sworn in. By the time I'm sworn in, I'm going to have these people ready to go be sworn in with me. That's the things that we're going to do from that standpoint. And we're going to be looking at, like I said earlier, we're going to be looking at executive orders to fix this lawsuit abuse. And then I'm going to reach out to the new leadership in the House and the Senate. And we're going to say where the leadership is, what's their passion, what's their knowledge. And we're going to be organized. So when they're all sworn in at the same time, we're going to be ready to roll. In January, we're going to be ready to roll. We're going to know what bills we want to do, what, we, what we're going to attack that first session. We're going to be prepared, even to the point of we're going to have a retreat with all our new legislators, conservative ones, and we're going to have a plan. We're going to make sure that they're not walking around in the dark. They're going to, we're going to have mentors for them. We're going to answer their questions. We're going to spend a week working on things. And we're going to have a plan. When we hit the ground, when we're sworn in, we're going to work. That's going to be my first 100 days right there. Because when we get sworn in, the job is started. That's what a business person does. Puts the plan together, bring together the talent, put a plan together that we can live with, have accountability, and things of that nature. By the way, we are going to implement the Louisiana checkbook. This is ridiculous what's going on. That was passed in 18. It spoke, we, kinda, we could have got it done for $350,000 in three months. And if you don't know what that is, that's where every dollar spent in our state government was supposed to be online where you can see where we're wasting money, spending money. How can you run a business and you don't know where the money is being spent? But what does our governor do? He and Darden, they decide to spend $26 million and take five years to put it in place. How ridiculous is that? Why? They don't want you to know what that money has been. And guess which one is the last one to come online two years from now? Department of Health, the largest one. We find out that we wasted almost $100 million. That's what we have now. Business people do not put up with that foolishness. We will put that together when we hit the ground running once we're sworn in. Thank you, Congressman Abraham. So first 100 days, certainly we as I've said, we're going to reverse ITEP. We are going to stop in the ways we've described bringing you to the table, these legacy lawsuits, but then when we do that, we bring you to the table also to be the solution for our coastal erosion. Right now, you guys are getting marginated. You're getting blamed. You're not the, you're not the problem here. You are the solution. And once we allow you to come to this table, bring your knowledge base with you, bring what you know will rebuild, restore, and replenish our coast, then that is a critical factor because we, as you know, continue to lose football fields a day. And that's just unacceptable, certainly here in Louisiana. It's not only a state emergency, but it's a national emergency. And as I've said previously, the other thing that we will do immediately out of the gate is we will call a special session. And we will address tort reform, infrastructure, and budget. Eddie alluded to the Medicaid expansion. It's a, it's a nightmare. And right now, there are people on those rolls that should not be there. 1,600 that are making over 100,000 a year. I'm a physician. I understand how, how important it is for those that are less fortunate than us to have that safety net, but we've got to make it better for not only the patient, but we've got to make it better for the taxpayer too. So that's where we're going to go. And you're going to see, again, with Governor Abraham and a good legislature, it won't take 100 days to see results. You'll start seeing it very quickly and very efficiently. It's not that hard. It's not rocket science. It's not neurosurgery. It's really, truly economics 101. Okay. Thank you for that. So we have, so I have the lightning round here, the last one. So we'll start here with Congressman Abraham. Um, 
What is your favorite movie? Top Gun. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Responi? Uh, I, you know, I'm not a really a movie buff, but I would say Brian Piccolo. All right. Brian Song is referred to. Um, so now we'll start with you, Mr. Responi, with this. Red beans and rice or gumbo? Red beans and rice. Gumbo. <laughs> yeah. Potato salad or rice? Rice. All right. With that, Gifford? All right, very good. Well, we spaghetti and meatballs. <laughs> you didn't ask me what my favorite was. Well, yeah, I should have. You should see the list that we did not ask. Um, I got a lot next. <laughs> we had some good ones. Yeah. Um, all right, so we'll finish up here with uh, closing comments for this evening. Again, you've got three minutes to make your your final pitch to Louisiana's oil and gas industry, um, and we will uh, we'll go in the reverse order that we did when we first started with opening comments. And so Mr. Misponi, we'll start with you, and then and then Congressman Abraham, you can close it out for us. Oh, great! Thank you so much. Um, you know what I want to emphasize here is that we're last, folks. We know it. We've been last too long. You know, we've been last the last three years when it comes to job creation, economy. We have to do something different. It really is, it's, we don't have to accept being last. And what I'm telling people is that in order to not be last, we have tried career politicians for decades on both sides of the coin. We need to do something different. Other states are doing it, Arizona, Tennessee, Texas, Louise, uh, Florida, you name it, Nebraska, North Dakota, they have went out and elected a businessman, someone has never run before, someone that has the skill set and the tenacity and not beholden a special interest to turn their states around. But you didn't hear about that. You only heard about it when T President Trump got elected. And all of a sudden, this guy gets there, we, we don't have to lose jobs. We don't have to have a slow economy. We can do things different. And he is delivered. Why? Because he's not beholden to special interests. He has business skills. He has the tenacity to go against the status quo on both sides of the aisle. He is making our country motivated. We have the best economy in decades. We have the lowest unemployment since 1969. We are doing things now that they said were not possible. It's time Louisiana does the same thing. If we expect different results, you have to elect a different kind of governor. And that's me. You have to elect someone that's an outsider, a conservative, someone that's a CEO of a $30 billion operation that we have here, someone that's not beholden to special interests, and someone that has the fight in them to go against the status quo to get us off the bottom. And that's what I'm asking you for. I'm asking you for your sport. I'm asking you for your vote. And I'm asking you for your prayers for my wife and I. This is a challenge for us. At this stage in life with 24 grandchildren, the only reason we're in this is for your children and grandchildren in the future of Louisiana. Why else would someone like that be in this fight? We're going to fight for this future of Louisiana and we're going to make some sea changes to get off the bottom and get us going in the right direction. And that's what I'm asking you for. Again, your support, your vote, and your prayers. And thank you for being here, and I appreciate your industry because I'm in that industry as well. Thank you. Thanks again for allowing us to be here, and again, thanks again for what you do. This is an existential election for Louisiana. It is. If you allow your current governor, my current governor, another four years, then what you've seen in these last four years will be a cakewalk to what you will endure coming up, not only in your industry, but in every industry across this state. We cannot allow that to happen. We must win. I'm the candidate that can beat John Bell. We're to the state of the race now. We're polling and tracking are happening almost every other day. And we beat this guy. When 
you go to the grocery store, when you go to church, when you go to the mini mart and buy gas, you have that discussion with whoever you come up with and please tell them to go vote. Early voting, September 28th. Primary, October 12th. We know that John Bell Edwards and his people are going to move mountains to get their vote out. As Republicans, we must meet that challenge and we must beat that challenge because that's the way we win this election. Diane and I have a daughter in Texas. She has three of our grandchildren. I want them back. I want those 68,000 Louisianians that have left because they couldn't get a job here. I want them back. And what we have here in Louisiana, a unique culture, people that actually want to go to work and get a job, have a job, feed their family, we need to get that on the forefront and allow us to unleash Louisiana and let Louisiana win. So thank you. I also ask for your prayers and your vote, your support. Tell everybody you know, on the day of election, about two or three o'clock, what I'll ask you to do is call your friends. And if they haven't voted, go get them. Put them in your car, lock your door, and take them to the poll. So that's the way we win the election. So again, thank you for having us. just want to say on behalf of Gifford and myself, thank you very much for coming today. Uh, we really appreciate it. Uh, it's something that we've had throughout the entire day for this conference and, and, and the dialogue that we've had is change, right? That's a lot of things that has really been speaking to all of us here in the, in the industry, here in the conference today. So we really appreciate all that dialogue about moving towards something with change. So thank you for that very much for your service and working towards a, a greater good. Lamoga is phenomenal that we appreciate what they do for the state. They're still our leading taxpayer. They're still our leading employer. We're going to make it better. We want them to reinvest, to come back in and have these good jobs that our people need here in Louisiana. So it's just more for me an appreciation of saying thank you. What separates you from the other candidates in this race? Ah, you know, I'm public service. I've, uh, you know, I'm the guy that delivers the goods. I've been up in uh, Congress now, going on uh, my third term. Uh, we know how to make the system work for Louisiana, and we're going to continue to do that for the state. Once we're in that governor's mansion, we're going to unleash energy. We're going to unleash business, and you're going to see these jobs come to Louisiana. Well, our message here today that we have to bring the oil and gas industry back to Louisiana. We have to undo everything that the trial lawyers and our governor has caused here. Killing jobs, thousands of jobs. We're not getting the revenues that we need. We're, we're, we're losing hundreds of millions of dollars of revenue as well because of the lawsuit abuse by these liberal trial lawyers and our governor. So the message is going to be that we're going to bring these jobs back. As governor, I'm going to make sure that we reach out to the oil and gas industry and tell them we have a new sheriff in town. And I'm not going to be controlled by trial lawyers. And we're going to do everything we can to work with the locals to bring these jobs back. And that's what it's about. What separates you from the other candidates in this race? Well, I'm the only one that's a conservative outsider. I'm the only one that has some serious business skill. The only one that's been a CEO. The only one, in this case here, that's worked in the oil and gas industry, created thousands of jobs over the last 40 years. And the main thing, too, is that I fill those jobs with Louisiana citizens. I understand what the education process is, the training process, what's important, and we're going to do that. We're going to work with the industry, we're going to work with the locals, and we're going to bring these jobs back to Louisiana, and particularly in the oil and gas, and then we're going to fill them with Louisiana citizens. I was just talking with Suella, a gentleman over at Suella, you know. We, I have kept people in the trainings for decades, I mean decades, thousands of people understand what it means to do that. You got to have the people, you got to have the jobs, and that's what I'm out about for. I'm an outsider, I'm not a politician, you know, that's what it's going to take. I'm not beholden to special interest groups. It's time to do something different if we want different outcomes.